with the military railway service. Now, World War I, moving forward a little bit, the railroads were used in different conflicts moving up into that time, but 1917-1918 was a formative point for the lead up to World War II, and you might even compare it to being a debacle, a disaster. Uh, the private railroads did not maintain their networks well for transportation of men and equipment. They were out for their own personal gain. They did not cooperate with the federal authorities very well, and unfortunately for them, the government decided to actually overtake the American railroad networks. They could then get cars out to the coast and over to France and get the supplies where they needed to go. Now, one of the most telling numbers you'll see here at the bottom right-hand side is the crisis of 1917. 180,000 loaded rail cars were unable to be used because the railroad companies did not know how to unload military equipment and get it onto the ships. That was a very, very bad thing for our uh, servicemen when they needed those, that equipment, as well as the need for extra cars to ship military supplies. Now, looking forward, this is William Gibbs Magadu. Uh, now, this would actually play a great role in World War II. Uh, he was the Secretary of the Treasury under President Woodrow Wilson. Uh, and he was tasked with overtaking the roles of railroads and coordinating them all the way to the end of the war because of their uh, rival rivalries they had as private companies. As you can see here in one of these propaganda posters, they had to keep them going to fight the Hun. So William Gibbs McAdoo, who had actually, actually no uh, realistic transportation experience, was the person that was headed with that particular task. And as you might imagine, the railroads did not like this whatsoever. They were losing profits, they were forced to do um, a, a very monumental task. And by 1930s, 1940s, they had started to learn their lessons. They knew that war clouds might be looming by 1938, 1939. They saw things happening in Poland. Uh, and they saw burgeoning industries like the steel industry for Sherman tanks, uh, Stewart tanks, aircraft industries, gasoline shipments. Uh, and so this is where they actually began to learn a little bit. They had improved trackage across the entire American railroad network, even right here in Cleveland, Tennessee. You had the cooperation among the private railroads themselves. Uh, now, by World War II, they said, we don't want to be overtaken ever again. We can work together for the national good. And that was one of the most formative things that came out of that 19. 17 experience. There are two individuals that were very influential in this whole movement of standardizing the railroads for national defense, and they were Ralph Budd, uh, he was actually a manufacturer of streamlined rail cars. You'll see one of his advertisements just to the right here for the Denver Zephyr, uh, and he actually advertised pre-war there that the stainless steel would save more steel for the tanks themselves. It was both a marketing strategy as well as a practical solution at that time period. Uh, the other individual that we can credit with much of the World War II transportation network is Joseph Eastman now in the formation of the Office of Defense Transportation. Now instead of overtaking the railroads, we had a federal transportation coordinator that was one of his positions from 1933 to 1936. He also had practical railroad experience through serving on the Interstate Commerce Commission. He needed uh, experienced people in the right roles at that time. He was the right man to oversee the entire defense network uh, during World War II. Also a member of the War Production Board. He knew raw materials, he knew what it would take to build boxcars, to build tanks, ammunition, jeeps, how to get them uh, from a raw material to a completed good into the coast. So again, you've got the right person at the right time. Now, this is just a, one small example of a railway system. There are many other Class I railroad companies, as they were called, that were uh, tasked with shipping goods. Uh, but this is the Southern Railway System that did serve the East Tennessee region here. And you'll see the, the main thing I want you to take away from this is just how influential from port to port, coast to coast, and well as, as well as inland that these were. These are the arteries of America in wartime. Uh, and, and many of these different lines would intersect as they went west, north, east, south, and many other lines all in between here. Uh, very crucial points here, of course, in New Orleans, as well as on the east coast going out towards the Atlantic. Now, one of the first things that the railroads would be tasked with was movement of troops by troop train. Uh, this was part of 
most all servicemen's experience uh, starting in the early war period as well as through demobilization. Now, uh, there were over 113,000 special troop trains that were called uh, by Washington, D.C. specifically. And this does not include all the troop movements that would happen from movements that were not called by Washington, D.C. This is one particular example of troops that would eventually be Normandy bound. This is in Tullahoma, Tennessee. This is the 30th Infantry Division, also known as the Old Hickory Division, named for Andrew Jackson. And this is actually a group coming offloaded from the NC and St. L, the National Chattanooga and St. Louis Railway. This group of individuals trained in Tullahoma because after D-Day, they would eventually move to the breakout of Normandy and become known as Roosevelt's SS. They fought so fiercely in Normandy after they had established a toehold that the 1st SS Division actually dubbed them the 1st SS. They said they dubbed them Roosevelt's SS. They said they are so, such fierce fighters, we respect them that much. And their formative experience was off of the troop train right here in Middle Tennessee. Now, here you see another vantage point of a troop train. What happens when they go from training, how they actually get to the coast? Well, right here is a picture of Hampton Roads, Newport, Virginia. And a troop train is actually pulled right into the platform where we have an adjacent troop transport and a damage plane waiting. Most often, that would be one of the typical scenes uh, of troops offloading to go eastbound. So quite literally, from troop to ship, then ship to shore. You can make a lot of those connections here by seeing some of the photographs in an aerial perspective. Now, the troop trains were running 1938, 1939, 1940, as people were training, the, the war industry was, was booming uh, as we were preparing for the impending crisis. But an unintended crisis actually hit America in 1942. We did not expect this whatsoever. The strangest thing started happening in the coast, right around the Gulf of Mexico, as well as the eastern seaboard. Little ships, little periscopes started popping up, and all of a sudden our oil transports exploded and went to the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico and the bottom of the Atlantic. And then those little periscopes would go away, slink off, never to be seen again until the next attack. And that was the German Kriegsmarine, the German Navy. And this was known by U-boat commanders, as you'll see a typical U-boat of the World War II time period here, as the happy time. Because they could almost, without any opposition whatsoever, pull up to the coast, they, did, they were extremely enthralled that the Americans would leave all the lights on, had no idea this was coming, and then put all their tonnage down to the bottom. So, to put this into perspective, February 1942, 73 ships were sunk off the Gulf of Mexico and the eastern seaboard. This is right in our front door. March 1942, 95 ships sunk. You can see that increase in tonnage. Now, Rear Admiral Samuel Elliott Morrison put it very well. It was a massacre as much a national disaster as if saboteurs had destroyed a half dozen of our biggest war plans. And many historians that I've read in talking about this, indeed some who were experts in Operation Trump and the U-boat campaigns, have said it was a greater setback strategically for the United States than December 7th of 1941. So how do we deal with this? Where do we go from here? We have no way to ship the crucial oil out to Europe that we need to get a toehold. There's a little bit of a visual for you to see just how severe that was. Each one of those little dots right there represents a ship that went down by U-boat. Railroads to the rescue. We didn't have a pipeline. We had no oil pipelines during that time frame, but we did have an existing spider web of railroads. And so this is one particular example of the National Chattanooga and St. Louis Railway, what we mentioned before with the troop trains, actually pulling an oil transport around the Lookout Mountain right in Chattanooga. They shipped many, many millions of oil going from Memphis, Tennessee, all the way down to Atlanta that would then take it to Point T's. Now, oil is the lifeline for every single mechanized vehicle that the United States had. We had C-47 Skytrains, German tanks, GPWGs. You need oil for that. So the NC and St. L came to, to the rescue. And Chattanooga, Tennessee was one of the major corridors that carried all of that oil to allow us to start to get that tow pole. Now, here are the full accomplishments of the oil shipments. And you'll see one of the period advertisements here that talks about the importance of that for the strategic bombing campaigns. 
Uh, Mid-1941, the railroads were only shipping 11,250 barrels of oil per day, but by the peak of shipment, it's well over 1 million. And they did this with barely any increase in additional cars or locomotives. They pulled every single thing out of mothballs they could find because the War Production Board said, no, we need this for more ammunition. We need more Thompson submachine guns. We need more M1 Durand. So they did this at a great disadvantage. And this was a lifeline until the two pipelines called the Little Inch and the Big Inch could be established, two oil pipelines that are still active to this very day that would then continue supplying all that oil for D-Day. So as we said before, we have two very significant pipelines, the Little and Big Inch, and this provided that continuous fuel so that we could carry on the strategic bombing campaign that was ongoing over Europe. Of course, in 1942, if you've ever seen those classic images of a B-17 bomber in formation going over France, going over Germany, it was that oil that was being carried on the NC and St. L that allowed them to do that until those pipelines could be established. Now here we have a typical scene here on board a troop train uh, and I just show you these two to, to bring a local connection in, as well as show you a few of the magnitudes of things that would have been uh, transported here on the right hand side. You actually have a guard on a gondola car. They're doing a full divisional movement with the 77th Infantry Division uh, with all of their large transport trucks. They're moving out west for their deployment uh, to the Pacific. Uh, there were very rare pictures as the government actually forbade most troop trains to have pictures taken of them. Uh, but it's representative of what you would have seen around 1943 and 44. Uh, on the left-hand side here, uh, if anyone happens to remember the, the uh, number 77th Infantry Division, if that sounds familiar to you, the individual at the back right-hand side there, about to put a little bit of food in his mouth on dinner on the diner there, that is actually Desmond T. Doss, the conscientious objective, the first to receive the Medal of Honor. He happened to be riding on that very uh, run that that life photographer took and had his picture taken at, at an opportune moment. So that's uh, kind of the daily impact that the troop trains would have had as they're eating, making their way out west. Now, the Soviets were actually waiting for us to invade Fortress Europe from the get-go, but we couldn't commit to it yet. We waited, we waited. We didn't have, we didn't have quite the manpower. We didn't have the mobilization. We were still building. The U-boats were attacking the coast. And right here, you can actually see a scene from around late 1942, early 43. This is the Battle of Stalingrad, where you had millions of Soviets and Germans fighting it out in the harshest of winter conditions. And Stalin says, we're losing men left and right. You've got to help us somehow. You've got to open up that second front to relieve the pressure on Eastern Europe. But we couldn't do it just yet. Our solution to that, though, was to bring the railroads in through Iran. Now, right here is the Iranian railway system. Right here is the Persian Gulf with Bandar Shakur at the bottom and Tehran at the top. We supplied the Soviets with many, many lend lease bits of equipment through that 865 mile corridor going from the Persian Gulf all the way up to Tehran up towards the Caspian Sea. That was one of the major corridors that allowed us to hold until we could actually open up that second front. The types of things that we shipped included tanks, and included submachine guns, included K rations to keep in supply as they were losing millions of men on the eastern front. And right here is the type of locomotive that would have made that run uh, going northbound on that 865 mile track. One of the other items that we actually produced here in the United States is called an Alco RSD1. Alco is the American locomotive company. Uh, and on that line going through up to Tehran, it was very treacherous. There were 3,000 bridges, very narrow tunnels. Um, and so this particular locomotive was taken away from the civilian contracts that had actually placed the order and sent right over to Iran. We actually have one of these in our collection at the Tennessee Valley Railroad Museum uh, in Chattanooga as a testament to that uh, time period before they opened up the second front. Now here we have a photograph of Erwin Rommel and his staff walking on the Normandy coast. Uh, and as we're, as we're shipping supplies up north through Iran, we're planning for invasion. We've been to North Africa, we've been in Italy, and we're just about ready to begin assaulting Hitler's Atlantic Wall. And a few of the things to take note of here, we'll talk about how production impacted these two, but uh, these are actually two overturned landing craft. If you've ever seen these pointed in towards the beach here, as the tides would come in, they would be hidden 
uh, sort of, there were very, very many obstacles that had to be overcome to see different Belgian gays and things called Rommel's asparagus that actually had little explosive Keller mines on them once the landing craft would hit them. These are the kinds of things that we had to uh, contend with. Now, many people know the story very well of B-Day. We have the airborne elements, of course, the 101st Airborne Division and the 82nd Airborne Division. Uh, you'll see a photo here of them getting ready to load up into uh, C-47 uh, sky trains to do a couple of things. Number one, they're to hold crossroads behind enemy lines in Normandy. Uh, secondly, take out enemy uh, artillery placements, things like that, just to soften it up for our troops on the beachheads. And remember how we talked about how various sounds impact um, our version of history. You heard that M1 Grand clip a little bit ago. I'm going to give you one more uh, to tell you a little bit about their experiences on the night of June 5th into June 6th. Is there another response to that one? This is a little bit of British production, also impacted by their railroad network, that impacted our men in Normandy. This is called a cricket. And the cricket is a little bit of a child's toy that they happen to supply in England. So British children might be going. But they learned that our men, once they dropped behind enemy lines, could not call and respond to each other verbally. That would almost be a death knell for them. So they issued these out to the 101st Airborne Division so that when they landed behind enemy lines, they heard this sound. The response, one click, responded by two click. And that's a friendly. Again, this is not American production, but shipped by the British Railways. A very simple toy and did save lives. And here's another photograph of some of those troopers getting ready to depart and jump out of their aircraft. Uh, one interesting thing I'd like to point out anecdotally about this photograph here, it's been published many times by many different newspapers, many different outlets. There's something very strange poking out from behind this reserve chute. It is actually a bugle. This is a field bugler with the first of elite planes. We don't always think about buglers uh, being parachutists and playing bugles in the field, but to him, that was a very important piece of kit that he took with him on Normandy. Again, a little bit of an anecdote there, but interesting enough uh, to see that in an original photograph. Now, the ground troops from ship to shore. This is one of the aerial photographs that was taken in reconnaissance. You can see a lot of those different obstacles on the Normandy beach here. Uh, as the tide is low, it will then come back in. We had to figure out a way to get them into shore once we got them over from the train onto the ship, on the landing ship tank or whatever they were uh, transported in, then over to uh, England, then off across the channel. How did we actually get them into the beach itself? This was a problem. This was a major problem in World War II to figure out how amphibious operations would actually come to fruition. Our solution? The Higgins boat. Developed by Andrew Jackson Higgins, who was a New Orleans native, who developed a shallow bottom boat that would be very adept at moving through the Louisiana bayous. But quickly, we figured out it had a practical military application. As you'll see, one of the examples of a Higgins boat here being loaded down from a ship, it had a little bow ramp up the front. And that bow ramp could drop down and enable your troops moving left and right sticks through that boat onto the beach, then they could put that bow ramp up moved back to their main ship and then reloaded for a successive wave. This was crucial for ground troops at Normandy. Now, how to actually supply those to the coast enter the railroads? These are actually flat cars for the Louisville and Nashville Railroad. They were one of the sole suppliers of equipment to what was called Higgins Industries there in Louisiana. They made many, many boats throughout the war and would ship their boats to west and the East Coast for various amphibious operations. Originally, those boats did not have a bow ramp, but the Marines complained about them a little bit. They're called LCPs, landing craft personnel, but they figured out pretty quickly it's not as easy of a thing to jump out the side as it is to go through the front and have an armored bow ramp that comes back in to protect the men. So transporting the LCPP, the landing craft vehicle personnel, uh, the Louisville National Railroad, again, was one of those major uh, transport companies for that. Uh, this was the first vehicle in line of invasion for again, the 1st Infantry Division, 4th Infantry Division, 29th, as well as the 2nd and 5th Rangers. They used a variety of different um, uh, landing, landing craft, but that was the uh, main one. And I always loved Higgins' quote 
about how he approached production to get them on the rails and out to the fighting men. He said, I operate in a big way. I don't give a damn about money. And I, amen, Andrew Jackson Davis. He was a true patriot at his time of both production, output, and supplying the fighting men. And this is a picture right here of one of those that was on the rails of the Louisville National Railroad before it ended up making its way to Normandy. You'll see troopers on the left and right hand side. Those men on the upper areas there are actually going to help operate, get that bow down, and make a clear way for the left and the right hand side uh, sticks to make their way to the beach. And this is kind of a haunting photo. This is on the morning of June 6th from one LCVP to others. You can see some of the first waves making their way in to the Omaha Bluffs that you'll see well uh, below that uh, skyline there. Uh, but a very somber photo to see the churning, the cold, the cold rain that really sets the tone for how production ended up in one of the most important pivotal moments in American history. So other things that the railroad supplied, we had clothing, clothing industries. They had gas impregnated clothing that we thought the Germans would actually do gas impacts on us. We had uh, rifles, bayonet, ammunition. The Wolf Creek Arsenal in West Tennessee, the local national, also served that. They had 60 millimeter mortars, 50 caliber machine gun ammunition, 30 caliber machine gun ammunition. Uh, many thousands of rounds would have made their way to Normandy uh, from that very arsenal. Now, today we'll talk about a few of the, the weapons and things that the industries would support because we always assumed that things just ended up in the hands of troops. Uh, sorry, not enough hands, folks. This is the M1 Garand rifle. Uh, this was the standard infantry weapon of World War II. It is an eight-shot, semi-automatic, 30-caliber rifle. And as you heard just a little bit ago, it makes a very distinctive sound on the battlefield. ejects an eight-shot clip at the end of your eighth round. Now, there are various components to this rifle. You have steel from both the Pittsburgh steel industry as well as the Birmingham steel industry. You have rifle stocks that need to be turned that might have come from somewhere in Trimble, Tennessee. All of those things coalesce to a single rifle that is then put on a carton, then sent via rail to wherever those troops are training, issued out to that certain troop, then sent on a troop train with that particular soldier to the coast. Now, the full combat load for an M1 Durand rifle is about 176 rounds. And the M1 Durand is a case study for production. As the spring steel might have come from one source, the leather sling from another source, the rifle stock and the steel, again, from another source. So it is very important to see all the different elements of production of these weapons to see how many different rail lines might have been involved in the making of the invasion. Now another weapon you'll see here in a little bit, if you'd like to come up at the end of our talk here, is the Thompson submachine gun that was used uh, on D-Day by the 101st 82nd Airborne Division as well as troops on the ground making their way to the beach. Now this was first developed for trench sweeping uh, by John Thompson and used by gangsters such as John Dillinger, uh, the Barrow Gang, Pretty Boy Floyd, but then would go into the hands of U.S. and British militaries. Uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut is where many of those different weapons were manufactured. Again, these are examples of how the railroads impacted what they saw on the beach. Uh, 500,000 Thompsons from one company alone, uh, which was the Bridgeport, Connecticut uh, arm of things, and then over 1 million manufactured total. And for, uh, to put that into perspective for you, they actually manufactured uh, the facility for the Thompson submachine gun based on their access to water and rail facilities. And this is another local connection for you. This is not a D-Day connection specifically, but you might recognize some of the individuals in this photo here. Uh, on the right, you have Medal of Honor Cynthia Allen C. York. On the left is Paul Huff, a very true um, a hero in this area. His Medal of Honor actually resides just outside the door here. He's holding one of those same Bridgeport, Connecticut Thompson submachine guns. Now, another product of the railroads that helped supply the invasion of Normandy was through the things that they ate. Um, many people don't know, but Chattanooga, Tennessee was a location where 34 million hay rations 
were actually manufactured during World War II. There are many major contractors of pay rations. These are the emergency rations that you need that you carry in your pockets that have a little bit of meat, possibly some candy, cigarettes, gum. But the men depended on them when they could not set up a full field kitchen. Uh, they have high caloric intake uh, for those emergency needs. And you see many, many photographs of troops on the beach eating those pay rations. Whether they like it or not, they had to have it in their pocket. Uh, and here's a typical example of what one of those would have looked like in the dinner unit that has various crackers, uh, matches, Chesterfield cigarettes. Uh, Hershey and Wrigley were also major contractors of those. But again, the Southern Railway in Chattanooga was one of the main suppliers of those for our fighting men. And you'll see from that, we actually have a second armored division individual here on the left who is eating out of K and C rations, as well as an individual on the right, one of the paratroopers, shortly after D-Day, taking a snack with one of his field knives there out of a K and or C ration. Now, one of the unsung stories I also think we ought to talk about a little bit here for the D-Day invasion is those of the Barrage Balloon Battalions. In many of the photographs of Normandy, you'll see these large balloons hanging over the invasion beach. Well, those balloons actually originated right here in Tennessee. Paris, Tennessee was the location of a camp called Camp Tyson. And Camp Tyson trained a group called the 320th Barrage Balloon Battalion. They were an all-African American unit that was tasked with raising balloons up into the air via a sealed cable that would then catch wings of enemy aircraft over invasion fleets. Camp Tyson in Paris, Tennessee was where those spearhead troops, an African American unit, would train, then moved by Allen and Railroad with their equipment before Normandy. Now, this is one of those final photographs of an establishment of the beachhead at Normandy, and there are a lot of different elements all together here. Uh, you've got production, you've got invasion, you have the railroads, you can't see them, but they're there. Millions of tonnage coming up onto the beach here and a very hard fight on June 6, 1944 to ensure that American production was not lost. We didn't lose a toehold in Europe. We took it. But it should be remembered that it was at a very high cost. Omaha Beach, 2,000 casualties. Sword Gold Beaches, 2,000 British casualties. That's killed, wounded, and missing in action. 10,000 total Allied casualties as a result of the actions on June 6th of 1944. The price of freedom is costly, and it took a lot of effort and a lot of individuals. And production is important, but it also should be remembered that it was due to those boots on the ground, those individuals that made their way ashore, those individuals that jumped out of C-47s, that made sure that that ammunition that was produced got to its intended targets so they could save America and preserve democracy. That's why it's important. Now, after the Normandy, Normandy invasion, things had to keep rolling. It couldn't just stop there at the beach. And here, quite simply, we talked about the military railway service a little bit earlier from the 1860s. Well, this was the modern iteration of that at the time. They actually put what's called a landing ship tank, an LST, up to the beach there in Normandy uh, in the mid part of June and started rolling flat cars, rolling different box cars, rolling locomotives onto the beach so they could then take the fight inland. And the second military railway service landed uh, shortly thereafter. The Southern Railway's railway operating battalion was running supplies from Cherbourg to Tarantan. Uh, and by 1944, you have over a quarter million tons of supplies that were shipped monthly right up to the front. In many instances, military railway service troops could hear the guns firing as they offloaded their box cars. And you're gonna see at the bottom, Two Sweet Express. Two Sweet means with a quickness. Uh, in French, it carried 385 tons daily, and there's a picture of the famous Tube Suite Express running from Paris all the way up to the front. They're getting ready for one of their daily runs with the boxcars behind the uh, very nice artwork to see on the front of the locomotive there. And here's another local. As they kept moving forward to Berlin, they started capturing German uh, steam locomotives. Uh, they had to rebuild many of the lines that we had bombed as part of those earlier campaigns in 1942 with the B-17s that were dropping bombs over Germany. And once they captured that equipment, they would rebuild the rail lines and then run them as far as they could to the front. That individual on the left there is Private uh, Lewis Miller, actually from Chattanooga, Tennessee, working to break open the locomotive and restore it back to service. Now, in popular culture, 
how the railroads continued to impact after D-Day. Well, here's a, a photograph of a B-24 bomber uh, that's actually named the Chattanooga Choo Choo, the flying boxcar. There are many different vehicles in that time frame as uh, the Chattanooga Choo Choo was a famous uh, song uh, with, by the Glenn Miller Orchestra at that time. And that's one example of how the railroads were impacting the fight in popular culture as well, not only on the ground, but also in popular memory. Now, the transportation legacy, what, what did they do overall? What are the numbers there? Railroads transported over 97% of all service personnel that put on a uniform in World War II. 90% of all wartime freight. Again, well over 111,000 special troop trains that were top secret government movements. And they are the critical web link, as you saw on that uh, map just a few moments ago, the Southern Railway, that linked procurement, production, output, issue, and deployment. Now, today we have various ways of remembering D-Day. Um, first and foremost, we have the popular culture elements of it. Uh, many in this room, I'm sure, have seen either The Longest Day or Saving Private Ryan. And of course, they do have their certain inaccuracies, but I do think they do one thing well. They make us remember the fact that it happened. Because I think that's one of the greatest things that uh, uh, that could go wrong is for us to forget the sacrifices that were made that day, the effort that it took for Allied invasion and how it continues to impact us to this very day. Now, we bring this up to the forefront a little bit. How does that experience relate to our experiences today? How can we understand a little bit about what it was like for the American Railroad Network to go to war? What it was like to procure weapons and ammunition? What it was like to ride along the rails not knowing where you might be going on a troop train. Well, again, we work with the education department at the Tennessee Valley Railroad Museum. We actually preserve that legacy of domestic rail transportation for future generations. That's one of our key mission statements is to educate for future generations. So right here, we actually have a functioning steam locomotive from 1911. Uh, it was actually used during the wartime time period for uh, different freight transportation uh, and is used for hauls that we take to Somerville, Georgia with authentic World War II type equipment. Now, it's known as a 282 type locomotive, uh, which actually was called a Mikado during World War II. That was one of the workhorses of transportation. But uh, Mikado is a Japanese word for emperor. And the first day wheel arrangement were delivered to the Empire of Japan. And as you can imagine, we had a little bit of a problem with calling things by their Japanese names after December 7th of 1941. <laughs> so this is one thing I really like to point out to folks. This was the Central of Georgia Railway that wrote a letter to Douglas MacArthur notifying him that they were renaming their Mikados MacArthur's. <laughs> and they were very proud to do so. Uh, now, you'll like uh, this photograph right here. This is a picture of one of the Central of Georgia Railway workers during World War II taking out the MK, hanging over and putting M-A-C-A. -A. They made an official policy to rename MacArthur's. And here's a letter back to Douglas MacArthur. It says, I'm grateful to you and your company for giving my name to your freight locomotives. It is my hope and belief that the men in my command who you had in mind when you decided to take such, such action can efface our enemy just as effectively as your fire has erased Mikados from the side of your locomotives. To that end, I know the entire American population are fully determined, and if the renaming of your locomotives will help in the mighty effort, I am thankful to you for thus making use of my name. So he was very much proud of his part in wartime history. Uh, another one of our wartime artifacts that we have to, to recreate that troop train experience is the Southern Railways Number 630, built in 1904 by the American Locomotive Company. Uh, again, it was also used in freight service during that time, but we do pull passenger runs at the Tennessee Valley Railroad Museum, both on a uh, three-mile stretch called our Missionary Bridge Local, as well as on longer excursions. And we also have very typical examples. These are rolling artifacts, quite literally, of what the traditional troop train Pullman coach would have looked like. This is the number 1,000 uh, built by the Pullman Company in the mid-1920s. And there is its appearance on the inside. It has not been modernized, still has the open windows, much like the 20s would have been when they did not modernize through the 1940s. As we know, we weren't allowed to produce many more cars. We had to make do or do without. So this is kind of our throwback to the make do or do without uh, mentality. We also have another coach that was modernized in the 1930s or 1940s called the 906, also a World War II correct type Pullman coach. 
as well as a sleeping car, a Pullman sleeping car from 1921 called the Clover Colony. Now, one important aspect of true transportation domestically during World War II was the dining car. And we also offer a program at the Tennessee Valley Railroad Museum to recreate that setting in what we call our Dinner on the Diner program. It is in a 1924 original dining car, much of trips would have dined in both on the way as well as upon demobilization. And this is our missionary Rich Lovell. Now, this line was significant that we run at the Tennessee Valley Railroad Museum as it saw as many as 70 troop trains per day during World War II. 70 troop trains per day, that is back and forth, and that carried many of those men that would hit the beaches of Normandy uh, on that very line. We run five trips a day, seven days a week behind steam engines on this particular example here. And a World War II era tunnel that we have, 986 feet long, originally built in 1858, was also in use for troop train hauls from 1941 to 1945. Now, we've made a few connections about how the railroads impacted the beaches of Normandy, and a little bit about what we offer at the Tennessee Valley Railroad Museum to recreate that experience, but what is it ultimately about? Because it's not about simple artifacts that sit there for the sake of themselves. It's not for a train to go back and forth just to say that we did it, because that's wonderful to see. We love to see those things. Why is it important? Well, recently on one of our runs to Somerville, Georgia, uh, I was working on one of the trains there, as you can see, and I walked into Grand Junction Station uh, there at Cromwell Road in Chattanooga, and I saw a man uh, a, a little older than I am, not too much there, uh, but he had a hat on that said First Marine Division. And I said, sir, I, I like that hat. I appreciate your service. He said, oh, yes, yes, I'm very excited. I said, well, what are you excited about today? He said, I have ridden the train since I went off to the 1st Marine Division and I went to Saipan. And it, it broke me a little bit. He got to ride with us that day. He shook hands with us. He talked to all the passengers, told them all about it, and he was the youngest passenger with us that very day. And we got to relive that experience with him and create new memories that he can then share with his family. Uh, so that's ultimately what it's about. It's not about the artifacts. It's not about simple things going back and forth or telling you why logistics are important, but it's about creating experiences, remembering experiences of those real individuals, those real soldiers that rode the war, not knowing where they were going, but committing themselves to do the job and do it faithfully. Now, how do we get involved? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to encourage you to uh, come and see us at the Tennessee Valley Railroad Museum because the, the experience of the railroads is the experience of World War II in some way, shape, or form. Uh, but as a final point, I want to turn it back to today, June 6, 1944. And instead of telling you about all the different rides we might be able to offer or all the different experiences that uh, I might have had, I want to read the words of Dwight Eisenhower. As many of those men went thousands and thousands of miles across the railroad network on a ship to eventually be handed this letter. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. In company with our brave allies and brothers in arms on other fronts, you will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. He will fight savagely. But this is the year 1944, much has happened since the Nazi triumphs of 1940-41. The United Nations have inflicted upon the Germans great defeats and open battle man to man. Our air offensive has seriously reduced the strength in air and capacity to wage overwhelming superiority in weapons and munitions of war and placed at our disposal great reserves in trained fighting men. The tide has turned. The free men of the world are marching together in victory. I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than full victory. Good luck, and let us beseech the blessings of Almighty God upon this great and 
noble undertaking. Signed, Dwight D. Eisenhower. And ladies and gentlemen, that is why today is important. The railroads were only a mere player in the grand scheme of the Allied invasion of Europe. But it is to those individuals who went ashore, those who supported the shore, those who jumped out of planes, those who supported democracy and the preservation of freedom that we dedicate our programming, and we want to thank you for coming to listen this evening.